Well, it was actually kind of funny. I was working in the library at the University of Rhode Island, and I was the head reference librarian and, and government documents librarian. And I was actually trying to close down the um, the chem lab library because it wasn't being supervised and everybody had keys and things were disappearing. And Dr. Winslow was a, was the um, one of the professors in the chemistry department. So one day <clears throat> he came to the office and he said, could I speak with you out in the hall? And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to be in trouble now. He doesn't want me closing down that, moving the the library next door into the main library. And it turned out instead of that, he offered me a job. And he said, well, you've been recommended to me by by a mutual friend. And he said, um, I'd like to know if you'd like to be the librarian at, at Wyndham College. I said, well, where is it? I've never heard of it. He said, in Putney, Vermont. I said, oh, that's interesting. So I wasn't looking for a job. But I said, well, I'll come up for a job interview. So I came up and and he spread out all the Edward Durrell Stone plans for the new campus, and um, they had the cellar of Frost Hall, I think it was, and Aiken Hall was, was there. I think that's the sequence. And um, then the rest of it was the town, old town gravel pit, which they had to fill in for years and years. They had a truck that said Big Bad John carrying tons and tons of, of dirt to make the lower area here. So anyway, um, I came up for the job interview and uh, everything was downtown and the old buildings, old houses and uh, the, the three-story Victorian house with a mansard roof opposite the Putney uh, post office was the library you know, with students living on the top floor. So everything was sort of wide open. I couldn't I couldn't lock up anything. <laughs> and um, anyway, it was an old, it was an old building and uh, had all kinds of problems. But anyway, uh, Dr. Winslow said, well, you have a chance to help design the new building. And it was, um, there was a man named Faraz Mystery. He was from India originally, and he was working for Edward Durrell Stone designing a campus. So we had some interesting sessions, and I was able to have some input into designing the new library. So I worked um, about three years, I guess, in the, um, in, the, um, in the old building, and I would drive up every noontime to see the progress on the new building, starting from the cellar. They started in December, which was hard, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, we moved in. Um, I think maybe in January or so, um, uh, a year later, and um, it was a sea of dirt and mud around there, and everybody used to drive up and park in front of the colonnade, and um, and then th the new library w was really beautiful. It had uh, deep red, thick carpeting it would just sink into. Um, they can't do that now because of fire hazards. But anyway, um, and the, um, the library was all painted cream color and the furniture was all uh, uh, stained walnut. And I designed a study carol and uh, they used that, they had those made. And we had black um, shel steel shelving and so then all the new books, uh, well, the books, uh, when they came in, uh, were very bright and showed up brilliantly. And um, it was quite different on the first floor. It had a wooden screen, and you've probably seen pictures of how it looked originally. But anyway, it was very pretty. And uh, so when the students started coming in to um, back to classes, they, they all automatically would take off their shoes because it was one thing, it was comfortable to walk around on this nice soft carpeting, but also uh, they didn't want to track mud in. And I'd had some problems with the uh, students in the old building that were always running up and down stairs and all around. Well, they really appreciated the new building. It was the first new academic building on the campus here on this level. so. That, that was fun. And President Winslow came in and said, your office is better than mine. I've 
tempted to take it away from you. <laughs> Well, when I left the uh, University of Rhode Island, they were building a new library, and it was six months behind because of a brick strike. And the associate librarian had left, and so the head librarian wanted me to uh, make charts of where all the new furniture was going in this uh, three or four story building. Huge, big cube of a building. So I had a little bit of practice doing that, looking at furniture and deciding where that was going to go. So. It was kind of funny. And then I, um, at, at Simmons College, where I went to graduate school for library science, uh, one of the reference courses uh, that I took, I took several, um, had to do with what would you do if you were to create a library? What reference books would you choose? So this was like all set, you know. So I had all these bibliographies, and so I started ordering books. and. Uh, I did the same thing again when I came back to, to Landmark. I had it all set. <laughs> uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, Harrison Sims was the president after Dr. Winslow, and uh, he had worked for 25 years for the U.S. State Department and had been ambassador to Jordan. And he used to meet King Hussein on a daily basis. But he came in um, and started spending money setting up all these programs. And um, the tradition had become that Dr. Winslow would go to the banks in, in the spring and always get a loan to carry us through the summer because we didn't have a summer school then. So um, this one April, uh, Mr. Sims went to... Um, the bank and they said we're not going to give you the loan and and this was it so he had a meeting and said the campus is going to be closing in in a month and and that will be it and then he did everything that you would do if you're going to close down he told all the creditors that the college was closing and so they wouldn't send any more materials and um, it was it was very difficult, but at that time we were getting ready for our 25th anniversary. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> um, and um, so Johnny Stones had been head of the student. He was president of the student body, and he was getting his PhD in psychology at Purdue University. He happened to come by the next day to talk about. Um, celebrations, you know, for the 25th anniversary, and everybody was just so distraught. He couldn't imagine what was going on, and then he heard that the college was closing soon, and um, so a group of us uh, were very impressed by him, and he had to eventually go back to Purdue, and um, so we sort of drafted him to come back and try and rescue the college. So Johnny Stone's put aside his PhD dissertation and, uh, and came back and he ran it for another year and a half, but it was very difficult because, uh, oh, some people were suing and attaching the payroll and so the payroll money was being sent from bank to bank so that some of the creditors couldn't find it. Well, eventually they put a blanket thing out for all of New England and New York, I guess. So we no longer were getting paid. And so we, we decided, well, we could work on what we would have been getting had we been on unemployment insurance. So we did that for a while, but then that money ran out, and meanwhile, they couldn't, they couldn't keep it going. So um, they had scaled down the curriculum and had let a lot of people go. And the bad thing was that they had a tenure system, and so many people had tenure that they had to eliminate entire departments. And so that, that was very difficult. So they scaled the whole thing down. And meanwhile, the Brattleboro Reformer was no help. Every time they mentioned Wyndham College, they talked, to, they talked about financially troubled Wyndham College, like that was the title of the college. And that scared away prospective students. 
And so finally, we really did have to close down. So I, I turned in all the keys and everything except one. I kept my master key to the building, hoping that someday another institution would come in. Well, then they talked about, well, maybe they would take some prisoners from Cuba <laughs> and have a, a um, I can't even think what you call it, but, uh, well, people that were not really bad criminals, and I think a lot of them were political prisoners, and Castro just wanted to get them out of, out of his way. But that caused a big uproar. Nobody wanted that to happen. And it got to the point where I thought, I wish they would just level the whole campus. I don't want to see it going downhill gradually, you know. So the campus was empty for about eight years, I think. And um, I never came down here again. And I, I had this key in a box on my bureau. Well, one day I um, read in the newspaper that Landmark School and Dr. Drake were looking for a facility to um, start a a college for students with dyslexia. So immediately I wrote to him and I had a, a nice letter from Jim Oliver, the, the new president, to uh, come down to um, Beverly, Massachusetts and have a job interview. So I went down there and he said, well, since Wyndham College had really failed, he said, we're not interested in hiring people that were part of that organization because we don't want things to happen that way again. But on the other hand, I had excellent references. And um, so um, he said, well, I'll think about it. And meanwhile, the campus was being completely rehabbed. And um, he invited me several months later to come up and, um, and look at the campus. So he gave me a campus tour of everything. And showed me the library and he said, now when I came here, he said the roof was leaking, it was raining, the water was pouring down the staircase like a waterfall and ended up in the basement and the, it was knee deep in the basement. And he said the other buildings weren't much better, so everything had to be rehabbed. So I think they had a $3 million grant uh, from someone in California to to start fixing the campus. So they did. So anyway, um, we walked around and we sat down in a chair. It was in, it was the old science building. I don't know what you call the building beyond the library now. The East building. Academic yeah. Building. The only place to sit down on the whole campus was some of these chairs that were screwed to the floor. It was an auditorium, like a theater. And so they hadn't been auctioned off. Everything else had been auctioned off, the books and everything. So he said, well, when can you start? And I said, you mean you're going to hire me? And he said, yes, I'd love to. And I said, oh, this is just wonderful. So anyway, I said, well, I'll have to give um, notice where I'm working. And I said, I'd, I'd give a couple of months notice. And so I said, we're having a trustees meeting and uh, told them the date. And I said, I'll tell them then that I'm resigning. So the night before that, he called me up on the telephone at home and said, now, you know, we don't know for sure that we're going to make a quota of something like 75 students that we need to open. If we don't get that, we will not be able to open and you will be out of a job if you resign your present job. But I really didn't like my present job at that time. <laughs> and I thought, oh, get me out of here. So I said, well, I'll, I'll gamble. I'll do it. So I said, OK. So I, I told them I was leaving. And, and um, in the meantime, I was rehabbing that library. We had it all painted. We had it made handicapped accessible and so on. And um, that was the library and, and the free Rockingham Free Public Library in Bells Falls, who was having their 100th anniversary this year. And tomorrow I'm going to a reception there for the 100th, unit, uh, 100th anniversary. So it's funny how things work out. But anyway, um, I left there and I said, well, I'm going to need a typewriter, electric typewriter, and books in print. And I need some bibliographies, 
for what I'm going to buy for books. So I was working on my back screen porch at home because there was no place down here to work. And, uh, and I ordered tons of books. And of course, books go out of print very quickly. So I didn't get all the books I wanted. But I was also using something called Books for College Libraries and Choice Magazine, which is for college libraries. So I, I, I sent all these book orders to Baker and Taylor to come pre-processed. I thought, there's nobody to help. So they've all got to come ready to go on the shelves and the cards ready to file the card catalog. That came a little bit later as I found out about them. The Brattleboro Retreat had three libraries and they gave up their patients library which turned out to be a, a gold mine because it was a lot of nice art books and poetry books and, and literature. And so we managed to get that very inexpensively. I went to Jim Oliver and I said, look, they want so much for this library. And he said, well, offer them half. <laughs> and I did, and we got it. So we got that, and then there was a young man who would taught in a university somewhere as a art historian and he had died and his parents offered his collection for sale and we got his collection of books also in art so that got us off to a good start in the art department. Um, no, only one student worker that I had at, at Wyndham, and I just couldn't understand what was the matter with her. She was obviously very bright, but her spelling was atrocious. She couldn't type. She would get things mixed up, and I thought, I don't understand what is the matter with this girl, but that, that was it. I didn't find out two years later. She never told me, and maybe she didn't know she was dyslexic and had learning disabilities, but... It was so frustrating. I used to really get almost angry. I thought, why can't she do the simplest things when she's obviously bright, you know? <laughs> oh, I went to all these lectures and workshops and things that they had on campus, and um, they had these in-house programs, and I always attended them, and it was very interesting, and... Jim Baucom was, was a great teacher and, and um, coaching us all. And, and everybody on the campus came, you know, the, um, all the workmen from the maintenance department, everybody, they all learned about what was going on with the students. So that was very helpful. And then I read a lot, too. And, of course, when I started buying books on the problem, um, I would be reading those, too, to see what was going on, and that was interesting. Oh, well, when, when Jim Oliver hired me, he said, I want you to create a library, a college library, and originally it was going to be a four-year college. So I started buying books for a four-year liberal arts college, and... Um, then um, I, I eventually, as the campus was, as the library was finished, I was the only one working in the library, and Bob Skeel was the was the new um, dean of students, and he was working in this building, uh, the administration building, and so we'd be the only ones on the campus, and um, so I was over there with with a sheet hanging over the window to keep the sun out of my office, and a and a kitchen chair and an old table and my electric typewriter and these books in print and uh, and pretty soon books started arriving and I opened a box one day by mistake and it was addressed to Jim Baucom and there were all these little books and they had words like fat, cat, mat, sat and I thought my gosh these kids can't read if this is the kind of books he's ordering and so I went to see him I said I thought we were creating a four-year college library. What's this? The students can't can't read. And he, well, he said, no, no, this is for the very low-level reading students. 
And in fact, a friend of mine said, now let me get this straight. You're creating a library for people who can't read? <laughs> so anyway, um, we got that straightened out. But um, then I sort of let up on the, on the junior and senior level books, except I continued buying books for the faculty to have as background teaching subjects and all things. Right. You know, they needed to have college level material to, to read themselves in order to teach. There was almost nothing written for people that were very bright, but written at a very low level. Um, and they were insulting to the intelligence, you know, these students. So it was very hard to, to find books that were appropriate. So you'd buy a third grade book, well, it was, you know, like, look, spot, look, or something like that. <laughs> Oh yes, I think they got better. I found several publishers that that did specialize in this kind of book, and uh, I can't remember them now. But I, I was buying almost everything they were publishing because, and then I would ask faculty for recommendations. Um, I feel like I'm back where I began because. Um, my f parents suffered a lot during the Depression, and their house wasn't foreclosed on. They had a new house, but they had to sell it uh, because they couldn't meet the mortgage. My father had a job through the Depression, and he worked for an insurance company who laid everybody off when they turned 40 years old because they didn't want to put them on a pension plan. So my father was out of work for two years, and it really took a toll and uh, we moved into the three-room summer cabin um, and lived there until my grandfather died, and then we moved into his larger house. But um, they, it took them years to recoup financially, and um, so my mother was a substitute teacher sometimes while I was in college, and she'd send me a little bit of extra money now and then, because money went further then than it does now. <laughs> So 10 or $20 was a big deal to get in the mail, you know. So they, they sacrificed a lot. We always read a lot and um, valued education. So I thought, well, I'll pass this along um, um, to, to, to all the students, you know. I didn't have any children of my own to put through college, so I thought, oh. It really is. Yeah, I wish it were more. And um, at the time I retired, I decided to retire a little earlier than I had originally expected. I, work, I thought I'd work until I was 65. And I think I was 58 or 9 when I retired. So um, I had to wait to get Social Security when I was 62. So I thought, well, I've got to come up with some more money. I need another $13,000 to make a $25,000 amount which would give a thousand dollar scholarship a year in that in those days since then it's really been invested a lot and has grown my great grandfather was elisha hunt rhodes and he went in as a private uh, in the second rhode island regiment and he came out colonel in charge of the regiment and um, uh, during the Civil War, and uh, so I had his his frock coat uniform, and um, so I decided to send it to auction. So um, I think I went to Sotheby's. And it may have been another auction. I can't remember. Anyway, they auctioned it off, and a man in Ohio bought it and put it on a mannequin in his living room. He had a big collection and sent me a picture of it. And uh, so anyway, I, that brought us to the $25,000 that I needed to start the scholarship fund. Yeah, and then there was another big collection of, of Civil War relics. And I thought, well, I can't really sell these. They were family. Things have been handed down several generations. And uh, 
it was an extensive collection, and I donated that to the um, Rhode Island Hysterical Society. So um, a lot of this was made possible by my uh, inheriting the manuscript that of um, his diary that he kept throughout the war, and I edited that and had it published as All for the Union, the uh, diary and letters of Elisha Hunt Rhodes. Yes, he quoted from it very extensively. And then last year, I went to another book uh, signing thing. A man named Les Ralston down in Rhode Island had spent 10 years working with my book and um, uh, documents written by James Rhodes Sheldon, who was a, a distant relative and, and a next-door neighbor of Elisha Rhodes. And so he came up with a book called uh, Long Time Gone, Neighbors Divided by the Civil War. And, and James Rhodes Sheldon, when he was a boy, his father died and his sister had married a Georgian. So they had a plantation in Georgia, so he went to live with her. And when the Civil War came along, he enlisted in the 50th Georgia Regiment, and Elisha was in the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment. And about 10 times they were at the same battle on different sides and fortunately never saw one another. They got together after the war. and, and um, So anyway, uh, Les Ralston wrote this book that came out last year. So that I found very interesting. Oh, I think survival and growth. I think it, it's very hard to start something from nothing. And when, when you start something and there's not even a paper clip on the campus, <laughs> everything has to be brought in, you know, everything has to be bought, and all the planning that goes into the curriculum. And, um, and even um, getting the internet uh, this this room, um, Jim Oliver started us meeting once a week after classes were over uh, with some of the businesses in the area um, from Townsend, Vermont, and Brattleboro, and uh, all kinds of things, and Marlboro College. And we'd sit around this table and try and figure out how we could get what they call a point of presence, a pop. The nearest way you could hook up with the internet then was Boston, and it was a long-distance call, so that was not helpful. It was too expensive. So eventually Sovanet came in in Bellows Falls and Brattleboro, and so we were able to hook up on the internet. And then um, we had Apple computers at first, and then uh, IBM, IBM gave a big grant and gave us a lot of computers. So. Yes, and, and struggled to keep up. I used to be a faculty secretary. They, they had two uh, programs at first. There was the, um, the lower level reading students who were in a, like a remedial program, and then there were the college credit students. Well, I was the faculty secretary for the meetings that we had uh, for the uh, college credit ones. Well, I was just learning to use a computer myself, and we had the apples at that point. And the students would ask me, well, how do you do this? I said, I don't know. Nobody's ever showed me how to use a computer. <laughs> so I sort of taught myself on that. I went to a few classes. And uh, um, then um, I would have to do the minutes of the meeting. And well, we'd have a one hour meeting, and it took me two minutes. It would take, take me two hours. We'd have a one hour meeting, and it would take me two hours to type up the minutes <laughs> because I didn't know what button to push. I'd get stuck sometimes, you know. So I, I'm not happy with computers. I just bought a new one, and uh, with Vista, and of course, now that I just bought Vista two months ago. They've come out with a Microsoft 7, which everybody says is so much better. And I said, it's the story of my life. <laughs> oh, um, 
um, how important determination is. Uh, one of the things about Landmark that I just love, I think I always was an overachiever. I always worked much harder than I needed to, even in jobs that I hated, like being in the Army. And one of the fellow privates said to me, you really like this, don't you? I said, no, I hate it. I can't stand it. The waste of time sitting around all day not knowing what was going to happen and just all this wasted time. And uh, But I said, it makes the time go by, so I, I keep busy. So even though I've been retired 13 years, I get up in the morning and I'm busy all day. I feel like I've got a job landscaping, uh, working on the house. Um, I have a book business online selling secondhand books. So, uh, and I just made um, 50 jars of raspberry jelly two days ago. It took me nine hours standing in the kitchen. Everything had to be strained and boiled and processed and sanitized and everything. And a f friend of mine, when I bought my my 1807 Cape house said, I can't believe that anybody at your age is taking on this project. It took 13 guys four months to rehab the entire house with new wiring, plumbing, jacking it up in the middle two inches, doing everything to it, you know. So I've always worked hard. And I, when I came here, I thought, wow, everybody here that's teaching and working here is like me. They're all, <laughs> they're all hard workers, and, and um, it used to drive me crazy when I would have to work with people at other places where some of them weren't doing their share, you know. So um, I, I'm inspired by how hard the students work here as well as the, the faculty and staff. And I've never seen a place where everybody works so hard, and they get such good results. Well, speaking of hard work, as um, Jeroul Edelji certainly did, and she would push the students to the utmost and have contracts that have to sign to um, promise that they would try harder and they would do these things, you know. She always had a twinkle in her eye, though, I think, and, um, and, and she was very firm, but she was also kind, but she was tough. You know, and uh, she was really a, a wonderful person. And Diane Wood, too, was was um, sort of bouncy and effervescent and and, um, and, and really liked to, to laugh and, and have a good time. And, and she was very good with the students working with them and getting things done. And I remember <laughs> I sent away s somewhere for a, a prize and what came in a box was a um, full-length imitation black fur coat. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? I gave it to Diane, and she put it on. And she was short, and it came right down to her ankles. Well, I saw her wear it a couple of times just for fun, and it, it was very funny. <laughs> So many funny things happen, and I can only think of one. Uh, the other day, you, when you asked me that, I thought, gee, I, I'm going blank on this. I can't think of anything. Well, I, I do remember something. It was um, April Fool's Day several years ago, and um, it turned out that uh, one of the faculty members and another guy had gone to all the men's bathrooms and had locked the doors that went into the toilet so you couldn't open them. But in the meantime, they had put, oh, excuse me, uh, stuffed boots and pant legs there so that when you walked into the room, it looked like there was somebody in the booth there sitting on the toilet. So I you know people would keep going in and out, in and out, and it was always occupied. And nobody thought to look to see that it was anybody really in. <laughs> I thought that was really funny, but I don't know if they still have it or not. There was a private bathroom here in the basement of the library for the library staff, so 
I first time I walked into the men's room, the regular men's room, and it looked like it was occupied. Well, I just went into the other one. But then people started complaining that, um, well, we can't get into the bathroom. What is the matter? <laughs> So it was really wild. Oh, I think it's a sense of mission to do something that hasn't been done before and to do it so well, I think, uh, and to work so hard to achieve it and to do it at such low pay and hard work is really, really remarkable, I think. I think the pay is probably better now than when I came. I... <laughs> well, I hope it will be copied uh, and that there will be other institutions that, if not whole institutions that would do what Landmark's doing, but that people would go forth from here and and use the methodology that Landmark is using and they keep improving it as they understand the brain and how it works. And I hope that students that benefit from Landmark will become strong alumni and, and, give, and give back to the college.